Good morning. Um, you know, a generation ago, millions of people around the world understood the full extent of the danger we faced from nuclear weapons. But unfortunately, that understanding has been lost largely. Uh, a whole generation has come of age which did not live through the Cold War and really was never taught about these weapons. And people of my age who didn't used to know this stuff in the past have pretty effectively erased it from our minds. So this is a wonderful conference uh, for bringing attention back to this issue. And I want to start this morning by just describing what would happen as the direct effects of a, of a modern nuclear war. Um, we're all familiar with the image of Hiroshima after the nuclear bombing there. And we have to understand this is not what the world will look like after a modern nuclear war. Hiroshima was one small bomb, about 15 kilotons, 15,000 tons of TNT. A modern attack on a city like Boston would involve not one bomb, but perhaps 10 or 12, each of them anywhere from 10 to 50 times more powerful than the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. It's difficult to describe 10 or 15 bombs going off all at the same time, so I'm going to use a model of a single explosion, a single 20 megaton bomb, 20 million tons of TNT. The megatonnage is actually a little bit bigger. It would probably fall on Boston. The destruction that I'm going to describe is actually an underestimate because you cause more damage by spreading out the, the bombs over more efficiently over a large area. But I think it gives an adequate understanding of the magnitude of the danger that we face. So a 20 megaton bomb going off over the State House in downtown. Within one one thousandth of a second, a fireball would form, reaching out for two miles in every direction, engulfing everything, including the building we're sitting in, in a fireball, which the temperatures within this would rise to up to 20 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than the surface of the sun and everything would be vaporized. The buildings, the people, the trees, the upper level of the earth itself would disappear. To a distance of four miles in every direction, the blast would generate overpressures of 25 pounds per square inch and winds in excess of 600 miles per hour. Mechanical forces of that magnitude can destroy anything that people can build. Underground shelters collapse when they're exposed to pressures this great. To a distance of six miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that automobiles would melt. To a distance of 10 miles in every direction, we're out now to the 128 Beltway, the winds would still be greater than 200 miles per hour. The blast pressure is still greater than 10 pounds per square inch. Forces of that magnitude will level masonry buildings, wooden frame buildings, a building like this would see the walls and the floors swept out. There'd be a steel skeleton left behind. To a distance of 16 miles in every direction, and note I've had to change the scale of the map to accommodate this zone of destruction. To a distance of 16 miles in every direction, the heat would still be so intense that everything flammable would burn. Paper, cloth, gasoline, wood, heating oil, plastic, it would all ignite causing hundreds of thousands of fires, which over the next half hour would coalesce into a firestorm, 32 miles across, covering over 800 square miles. Within this entire area, the temperatures would rise to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the oxygen would be consumed, and every living thing would die. In the case of Boston, we're talking about something on the order of 3 million people dead in a half an hour. Beyond this firestorm, the destruction would continue. To a distance of 19 miles, people standing outside would suffer third degree burns on any exposed skin. To a distance of 21 miles, second degree burns. To a distance of 40 miles, people who turned reflexly to look at the sudden flash of light would be blinded. There would be hundreds of thousands of casualties, all kinds of injuries. People blinded, as I mentioned, People made death by having their eardrums ruptured. People suffering penetrating wounds as shards of glass flew through the air. People with, with mechanical injuries and crush injuries from being thrown themselves through the air or being trapped under collapsing buildings. And most especially, there would be people with burns. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people with major burn injuries. They would all need urgent medical attention and that care would not be available. In the entire United States, 
there are about 2,000 burn beds. Here in the Boston area, there are three institutions, between them 46 burn beds for hundreds of thousands of patients. And all three of these facilities are in the zone of complete destruction. In fact, almost all of the hospitals in the metropolitan area would be destroyed. Most of the doctors would be dead. Most of the nurses would be dead. There'd be no electricity to power uh, EKG machines, x-ray machines. What few little supplies were not destroyed, blood products, antibiotics, pain medicine, would be used up in the first minutes of dealing with this catastrophe. There'd be no EMS system to transport people to hospitals. And in fact, the vast majority of the people who were injured would also die. And if this attack were part of a large-scale war between the United States and Russia, this same level of destruction would be visited on every major city in both countries. A study which we published in 2002 showed that if only 300 of the 1,500 warheads that the Russians maintain on hair trigger alert hit urban targets in the United States, 75 to 100 million people would be dead in the first half hour. In addition, the entire economic infrastructure of the country would be destroyed. All the things that we depend on to maintain our population, we're not hunter-gatherers or subsistence farmers. We need an intact society to live, and that society would be gone. The internet would be gone, the electric grid, the public health system, the food distribution system. None of this would exist anymore. And it is probable that in the months following this nuclear war, the vast majority of the American and Russian people who did not die in the initial attack would also die from exposure, from starvation, from radiation poisoning, from epidemic illness. All told, perhaps a half a million people, half a billion people, rather. And as my colleague, Professor Roebuck, will explain in his talk, these direct effects are only a part, and incredibly enough, only a small part of the damage that will be caused by nuclear war. So why talk about this? Well, for two reasons. First, because if we do not take action, this is the future that will be. This is going to happen. We've been told for 25 years that we don't need to worry about nuclear war between the United States and Russia. Well, even during that period, we knew that there could be an accident. And there have been at least five occasions since the early 1980s when either Moscow or Washington prepared to launch nuclear war in the mistaken belief that it was already under attack. But in the last two or three years, we've also come to understand that the assurances we received that deliberate nuclear war between the US and Russia was impossible, those assurances were hollow. The crisis in Ukraine has made it clear that the United States and Russia could end up on opposite sides of a military conflict. And since that crisis began, there's been unbelievable nuclear saber rattling on both sides. The Russians have threatened repeatedly to use nuclear weapons in response to this crisis. And NATO, for its part, has conducted military uh, exercises very close to Russian borders using nuclear-capable forces. It is an extremely dangerous situation and has led leaders on both sides to warn that the danger of nuclear war today is greater than at any time in the past, greater than it was during the 1980s. That's one reason why we need to talk about this. The other and more important reason is that this is not the future that must be. We don't have to go down this route. Nuclear weapons are not a force of nature. They're not an act of God. We've built them with our own hands, and we know how to take them apart. All that has been missing is the political will to do this. And fortunately, over the last few years, a new, powerful international movement has developed calling for the stigmatization, prohibition, and abolition of nuclear weapons. It's led <clears throat> excuse me, by the countries which do not currently have nuclear weapons, the non-nuclear weapons states, which have come to understand that they cannot rely on the United States and the other nuclear powers to meet their obligations under Article 6 of the NPT, that they, the non-nuclear weapons states, have to provide leadership. They've come together in a series of three very important intergovernmental conferences, the last of which was attended by 158 nations. Government conferences to discuss just this kind of information, what is going to happen if there actually is a nuclear war. And all three of these conferences have concluded with the obvious understanding that these weapons must be eliminated before they're used. At the United Nations last fall, 130 plus countries voted to establish what was called an ended working group 
to address the current gap in international law, which does not yet prohibit possession of these weapons. That open-ended working group is meeting in Geneva. It had its first session in February. It will convene again in May. And it is probable that it will recommend to the General Assembly this fall a new treaty banning the possession of nuclear weapons, defining their possession to be illegal, something which can change the entire tone of the international conversation about nuclear weapons and put unprecedented pressure on the nuclear weapon states to live up to their obligations under Article 6 and to sit down and negotiate a real binding nuclear weapons convention providing for the detailed steps to eliminate these arsenals. This is an extraordinary opportunity. Unfortunately, here in the United States, there's been almost a blackout about this process. There's been very little attention paid to it. And that becomes, I think, our job, to figure out how to build support for this international movement and how to take advantage of this international movement to put pressure on our government to meet its obligations and to eliminate its nuclear arsenal. This is a tremendous responsibility. It is a huge burden that sits on our shoulders. We are literally responsible for the fate of the Earth. But if this is a great burden, I think it is also something of a gift that has been given to us. Every one of us wants to do something good with our life. We have been given the opportunity to save the world, and that is a very good thing to do. It says in Deuteronomy, it's reported in Deuteronomy, that God said, behold, I have put before you life and death. Therefore, choose life that you and your children might live. That is literally the choice before us today, before all of humanity. And so let us, in our work today, dedicate ourselves to choosing wisely and to acting with courage and determination so that, indeed, our children might live. I want to thank you for coming to this meeting this morning. This is a difficult topic to talk about. It's a difficult way to spend a day. But even more, I want to thank you for the work which I know you're going to do after today. No one of us is expected to do this job all by ourselves, but every one of us is expected to do that part of the job which falls to us to do. And that is our individual responsibility in this situation. Thank you very much. We'll take a couple of questions uh, right now, and then we can have more questions later on. There's two uh, mics there, if you can talk up to the mics. Just speak loud. Okay, uh, Professor, I'm just wondering, in terms of uh, persuading people to join us, the average person in the street. Now, I remember in the 1980s, there were two films, one American, uh, The Day After, and the horrific British film called Threads. And I'm just wondering if such films make a comeback or be remade, can you come to convince people with images such as we've seen and movies such as that? I think it would be great. Uh, it would be great if we were able to get more films, especially popular films, uh, out about this subject. I think the reason why these weapons still exist is threefold. Uh, first of all, people don't know, that, don't believe that this can really happen. And secondly, they don't believe, they don't understand how bad it will be if it does happen. The third thing is that people don't believe they can do anything about it. And that's also a scientific factor. We're going to move on. Thank you very much.